Koha, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. You can go to Lovie in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to Lovie in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to Lovie in America and become an American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, a new talk show program featuring the lives of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion. Created by Think Tank Hawaii and the Kingsfield Law Office, we invite renowned immigrants to discuss their life stories, immigration adventures, and their contributions to cultural diversity. Today's guest is our good friend, Dr. Ross Tsai. Dr. Tsai is Vice President, Thailand Learning and Organizational Effectiveness at Trivent. She is also an adjunct professor at Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Tsai was previously was Vice President and Chief Learning Officer at Ecolab, responsible for enterprise learning and global institutional training. Dr. Tsai received her PhD in Curriculum and Instructional Technologies from the University of Minnesota, Master of Science in Information Media from St. Cloud University, and Bachelor of Arts in English Literature and Language from Nankai University in China. She's also past chair of the Board of Directors at Best Press, an executive mentor and a coach at the Mentium Corporation. Dr. Tsai is widely recognized as a leader in the Asian American community. Welcome to the show, Ross. So happy wow. to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, it, you know, I, I always uh, admire yeah. your leadership in the Asian American community. And uh, I had the privilege to uh, bring my students to your company and to hear from you uh, talk about learning and uh, leadership. And thank you again for that great opportunity. But I never have a chance to sit down with you to talk about you. So today, the purpose is, is you. We want to talk, learn more about you. Please tell us about your childhood. And I know you're from Tianjin. Mm -hmm. And your education, you received your, your bachelor degree from Nankai University, very prestigious university in China. And you, then you receive a master and a PhD from uh, American University. Please tell us about your, 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 your childhood, your education, and most importantly, how did you settle in Minnesota? Well, thank you for having me. It is such a pleasure to have this conversation with you, Chang. And uh, I think we all, uh, as immigrants, uh, have unique stories to tell. And it's fabulous that we have this channel to learn about each person's unique journey. There's nothing more difficult than talking about oneself. Uh, I, I, so I, I treasure this opportunity to really reflect on my process uh, of growing and uh, living uh, in America. I grew up in Tianjin, as you mentioned, uh, which is a northern city, very large industrial city in, in China. Um, and I grew up in, in, you know, back then, I would say, we well, probably materially uh, not very well off, but mm -hmm. it was a blissfully a uh, happy childhood because the community where I grew up in is very close knit. It was very mm -hmm. crowded, period, but it was a very close knit. You know, we I went to school with my neighbors and uh, you know had all my free time with friends who are neighbors. Um, so it was a, a very uh, wonderful, relaxing kind of a time. Uh, as much as we reflect on, gosh, you know, materially it was not very rich. But life was quite um, uh, fun as a as a child. I mm -hmm. did have a very unique culture, uh, educational experience. I grew up um, with the schools opening really late, so I wasn't actually able to go to school, formal school, until almost when I was nine years old. So my parents, who were both very dedicated to education, and they each had their own education disrupted because of the Second World War. Yes. Um, so my, my father managed to teach me how to use a dictionary. That's how literally how I learned. Um, and he was able to borrow a book from his factory's library uh, one at a time. 
And uh, once I learned how to use the dictionary, I, I felt unstoppable because you give me any book, I was able to, to figure out how to read it. And so by the time I actually went to school, uh, I had been exposed to, I had learned, I had taught myself how to read. And uh, I had been forced by my parents to take classes on the radio. If you remember way back when there was a whole channel just dedicated to education. So I yes. could learn Japanese one hour and English and another hour. Those were not fun. Uh, those were my parents' ambition that the, this wonderful time should not be wasted. So they wanted me. I mean, those textbooks cost them probably a month wages, uh, but they provided me those textbooks and wanted me to learn. Um, uh, so I became a master at changing the clock in my house because there was only one clock. And by changing that clock, I would miss my lessons all the time. Um, but, you know, mischief aside, I did get exposure to English and Japanese very early, uh, which helped me master other languages when I was, uh, you know, a grown up. Um, but I didn't get a chance to go to school until I was almost nine years old. School was very short back then, was only half day. Um, so I, I used the other half day to try to keep up my English studies. And um, because the, you know, the education system was quite fluid at the time, um, I was able to sit for the national college exam when I was 16. Um, because you, know, you could, if you convinced the school that you worked hard and so I was able to join the senior class, take, you know, took all the classes with the senior graduating class and took uh, private lessons. Those are all free volunteer lessons by my father's friends in the factory. Um, learned, you know, math and uh, advanced Chinese skills. Um, so I was able to sit in the national uh, college exam and I was really fortunate to be able to go to Nankai University and majored in English and minored in French. Wow. Um, so when, when I got to Nankai University, I literally felt like I've gone to book heaven. Uh, because if you remember during the Cultural Revolution, the libraries had been closed to the mm -hmm. public and the bookstores were quite bare. Um, so having access to the university with six book cards that you could borrow six books at a time. I thought that was the most amazing thing you can imagine. Yes. And yeah, so I just became an unstoppable reader. Um, and I always carried a dictionary with me, as you can imagine, you know, the vocabulary uh, of reading so much uh, was quite a challenge. So I became a person with an, a dictionary attached to me. Um, so that was a really blissful, wonderful four years of college uh, in Nankai University on the campus. Um, I was still able to go back recently to look at that campus, which has grown so much uh, in the past couple of decades here. But um, from there, we had several uh, visiting professors from all around the world, actually. We had professors from Europe, from Australia, from uh, U.S., and then uh, there were a couple of professors from Minnesota, actually, and they somehow saw the potential in me and introduced me to the Sinkhaw State University here in Minnesota and really made that connection uh, for me to actually be able to come to graduate school. And the only way that could happen, just given the financial circumstances, uh, was the professors in the department where I was attending school. It was the Department of Learning Resources and Information Media. The professors mm -hmm. literally took turns hosting me free of charge. You know, I lived with their families and uh, ate with their families and they supported me. They taught me how to drive. They, you know, taught me everything about how to say like classes and how to think about a career path. And I truly thank my St. Cloud State families for launching me in terms of career as a professional. Um, from there, I did my doctorate uh, here at the University of Minnesota. And um, from, from this point on, my career has become just an unbelievable journey of so many uh, mentors, professors, managers, colleagues, neighbors, 
who uh, encouraged me and coached me, um, connected me to opportunities, taking a chance on me. Um, so since then, uh, I married my husband who's from Malaysia, uh, but has also been studying in the US. Both of us met at the university and uh, started a family here in Minnesota. Both of our kids were born and raised in Minnesota in the public school system. They're both now working professionals, um, you know, doing really well for uh, the profession as well as the communities where they serve. Um, so my husband and I continue uh, to enjoy our life in Minnesota. We each have enjoyed really rewarding professional careers uh, here in, in the Twin Cities that has such a rich uh, business environment that you know, we each have enjoyed uh, lots of opportunities for growth and made lots of good friends. You know, so as far as we're concerned, this is home. Absolutely. Amazing and truly exceptional American story. It's, really? Let me get it right. And so you basically in seven years, you completed K-12. Nine years, nine years. Nine years. Yes. You're, you're truly a prodigy. And wow. no wonder the professors who met you and count, you know, way to do to introduce you to to Minnesota, and we are lucky to have you here. And you meant, you just mentioned you 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 recently uh, uh, revisited Tianjin. When yeah. was it? During the pandemic, right before the pandemic. It was oh. really, yeah, a wonderful circumstance because uh, in 2019, Nankai University celebrated its 100th anniversary. Yes. And as part of that celebration, many of us returned to campus, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to go back to our beloved campus. I mean, it was very emotional. Um, but as part of that journey, there's a whole group of us who started a fund. Uh, it was the Roland and Rachel Fisher Theater Activity Fund for the, uh, the Institute for Foreign Languages mm -hmm. uh, on the Nankai campus. Part of the reason was Roland and Rachel Fisher were instrumental in bringing theater, movies, uh, the, the, the activity of drama to the foreign languages. Back then it was a foreign language department and they both brought a passion and uh, just a really dynamic pedagogical approach of using film and drama as a way to advance language and uh, culture uh, exchange. So not only did they teach in, in that setting, they were also visionaries and instrumental in creating these tours. So there were at least two tours that I know of. Uh, the first one I was part of, where we brought a classical Chinese drama, and I was part of the Thunderstorm Lei Yu's, uh, uh, Yu's Lei Yu. Okay. Um, so we produced that in English and then toured 10 universities in the US. So that was the first of many, many uh, extraordinary culture exchanges so that, you know, we could bring Chinese literature and Chinese drama to the U.S. And then the Sinkhole State Theater Department actually produced Wizard of Oz and toured Chinese universities uh, and then back and forth. And then that same activity has occurred with other languages as well. So the impact of these two professors, not to mention the fact that they all Roland and Rachel Fisher became our kind of adopted mm -hmm. professional parents, so to speak. So there's a whole bunch of theater uh, alumni who put together this fund. So we launched that fund uh, specifically to support foreign language drama as a way to learn language and culture. Um, so we launched that during the 100 year anniversary mm -hmm. of the university. So we were all back. It was an amazing emotionally uh, rich experience. Um, and I also, as part of the Carlson uh, teaching assignment, uh, I went back again in 2019 to teach a global talent management course uh, as part of uh, the Carlson Global uh, Executive Education Program. Uh, both times I was able to spend a lot of time in Tianjin, you know, being mm -hmm. on campus and visiting family. Uh, in Tianjin and all of my friends from middle school. Um, so it was fantastic. It was right before the pandemic. Um, it, just the speed of 
growth and economic flourishing um, was just really tremendous. It was just very inspiring. I, I totally agree. And we love Nankai and we love Tianjin. You, you, you might remember my wife is from Tianjin. That's right. And which, yeah, which district you're from originally? Uh, yeah. Hebei. Hebei, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, my wife is from Hedong and uh, okay. we love Tianjin. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, you know, my favorite hotel, every time I go to Tianjin, I stay at the Astor Hotel. Oh, sure. Yes, yeah. sure. yeah, so because I love history. I love the, yeah. the, every time I stay. I think I stayed at the Fuzuo Yi suite, you know, oh, my more than I can remember. Wow. And, uh, they don't they don't allow guests to stay at the Dr. Sun Yatian suite anymore. Oh, okay. Tianjin is a fantastic, before Shanghai, there was Tianjin. Tianjin sure. was the most international, Right. Global and mm -hmm. cosmopolitan in in China, entire China, right? And you, and you, I'm through to 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 know that you are fast reader as well. I I read the books, and I I want to extend my warmest invitation to you to come to my my library. And <gasps> I brought uh I brought all my childhood books from China. no way. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, so I have uh, more than ten thousand books in my library. And that many is, of them probably you can recognize. That and is I, I totally relate when you talk about this hunger for knowledge right. you know, for, for our generation in, in the yeah. age. You know, this yeah. a book is so cherished, right? Valued. It's, a, a, it's not like the internet age, you can get any knowledge, you can Google it, you can get right. knowledge. But for us, it's a completely different learning experience. Right. Yeah. I now know. We get, yeah. Now we get to your specialty, learning. Yeah. You, uh, you, you spent many years of helping Fortune 500 corporations mm -hmm. and uh, to, uh, to develop leaders and uh, to train your employees. And uh, so what, how, mm -hmm. my, the question is two parts. So you, what does a great leadership leadership mean to you yeah. and the second you attract this talent and develop learning and a training program for you but now we are in this pandemic the, even yeah. near the end in this area of great resignation mm -hmm. and what do you do and what company do to retain mm -hmm. and develop your employee yeah yeah such a rich question boy we could spend quite some time here um so well, first of all, <laughs> I know <laughs> yeah I have been really fortunate to not only study leadership but um help organizations build leaders um at all levels of the organization so whether you're a first time uh, supervisor or a senior executive there are profound privileges as a leader as a company entrust you uh to lead a team and uh, in some ways, it's very much calling upon our leaders to uh, work for the greater good, you know, because leaders come with quite a bit of privilege in many ways. And how do you put that privilege and that power and that position uh, to good use? Um, so always at all levels, I uh, look at leaders who put the company's objectives to put who put the greater community needs. Uh, ahead of their own. So to me, leaders work for the greater good, uh, work for the interests of the team, work for the interests of the company and the community they serve. The second thing about being a leader is a leader cannot possibly get all the work done. Uh, a leader is one who must get things done through others and with others. So in that sense, to the extent that you're able to bring out the best in others is it, it determines your leadership uh, impact. So what can leaders do to uh, coach and develop and empower their team uh, that's directly correlated to their effectiveness? And the third thing I always think about leaders, there was a saying about, you know, leaders and learners are kind of the same because ultimately mm -hmm. the world is a fast changing world, right? You mentioned the idea around there's so much going on. There's great resignation. We're, you know, surviving the pandemic. 
um, and the technology is accelerating so fast. There's no way a leader can possibly sit on their laurels and say, I know the answers, you know, follow me. Um, truly, uh, the idea about leaders, I loved this statement from, uh, I think it's a futurist, uh, Alvin Toffner, who said the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who mm. cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And a oh. leader's appetite for finding new ways and being proven wrong and being willing to try new ways of getting things done uh, is essential to their effectiveness. So with all of that, as you think about during the great resignation, or we call it the great reshuffle, um, what are companies doing then to cultivate leaders? Because ultimately, leaders make the biggest difference in performance, in culture and in retaining and developing talent. So we clearly recognize that and we put a lot of emphasis on leaders' ability to connect employees' day-to-day -day work to the higher purpose. Every organization exists to serve society in some meaningful way. So whether you're doing day-to-day -day accounting or taking care of customers, how does that work serve the greater purpose? of the organization is very important right now as people are re-examining their life's priorities. Uh, and leaders are powerful instruments to create a sense of belonging, a sense of psychological safety, to create a place where every employee can bring their full self to fully contribute to the mission of that team. And during this really volatile situation uh, and moment in time, you know, empathy, uh, being real human, and uh, helping employees uh, find a path for career growth. Those are some of the most important things that we're asking leaders to do. Um, you know, it, you mentioned this great resignation situation. It is true, skill shortage is the number one disruptor to business right now. In fact, in 2021, there was a record number of American employees who resigned from their positions. You know, over 50 million people left their jobs mm. last year. Um, and burnout is the primary driver uh, for that resignation pattern. So what is it? You know, is it more pay? Is it opportunities for advancement? Is it um, relief in the sense of a new start? And many uh, discussions, many reports are now showing that this need for continue, continued flexibility is a driver to some of those career decisions. So there's a lot we can do to help our employees feel inspired, feel engaged, and mm -hmm. um, retain uh, with our organizations. Companies are really tuning into this because it is a challenge and it's a significant inhibitor for growth this year. Splendid. I'm taking notes. I think that <laughs> we're going to just publish what you said just said. And we will transcribe what you just said. It's going to be a great essay on leadership. Uh, and I thought, and, yeah, I thought employee myself. Mm. And, but I feel like this time is volatile, it's uncertain, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. complex, and it's ambiguous. Yes. And uh, uh, I suppose, like you, describe today's dynamic envir business environment as mm -hmm. uncertain, but to keep our faith. Mm -hmm. So, what's your advice to a people like me and to people younger than me? Yeah. And to build a fulfilling and a resilient career in this very yeah. fast changing world. Right. For sure. For sure. We're all employees, first and foremost. So, so many things that we can take charge um, instead of being victimized by circumstances. So, first of all, if you have not done so, speak up. You know, I recommend everyone to say, make sure your manager knows that you're hungry for development, make sure team members are aware that you're looking for opportunity to stretch and pick up new skills. Um, every team, every project that you work on, let people know that you are hungry and willing to try new things. And secondly, make learning your own objective. You know what, you know, we, we sometimes talk about five at five, like at five o'clock every day, take five minutes and think about what did I learn today? Is there any work or relationship that I need to draw closure on today? Or sometimes we have a 10, 10 at 10 kind of a mindset. I didn't invent these ideas. I learned it from others. 
that at 10 o'clock, you take 10 minutes and learn something, you know, reflect on a lesson learned today or read 10 pages. Um, you know, all of these things are small, but add up over time. Mm -hmm. um, Whitney Johnson has this powerful concept of taking the S curve of innovation and apply it to career development. So inevitably at the beginning of a new assignment, new job, new situation, you're feeling fearful, frustrated, anxious, is it gonna work? So you feel like optimistic to stress, but then gradually you rise on the back of that ice curve, at the S curve to feel like I'm successful, I'm unbeatable, I'm confident. When you reach the top of your S curve, you mm -hmm. feel like master of your trade. That's when actually there's the greatest danger in comfort zone because that's when you're least on your toes and that's where you're growing the least. So embrace that S curve and be willing to say, I'm going to try a new gig. I'm going to try a new assignment to keep myself growing. Um, so take this growth objective as your day-to-day -day priority rather than waiting for others to develop you. Wonderful advice to both the leaders and employees. So we are all learners. Just like, I, I think strike me like similar to in a courtroom, the both the judges and the lawyers are a learner. Right. And we kept, have to keep up with the development with law, just like business leaders right. and employees. Of course, you're the master at that. Uh, I'm not just no no master and uh, just a, a starting, and um, but I believe that what you uh, advise to the leaders and uh, employees to be lifelong learner, and yeah. it could be a, a, a lifelong important advice. And we are uh, just uh, have a minute uh, to left, but I do we do um, wrap up the show by asking our distinguished guests normally two questions. The question one is you were if you were to give some advice to mm. you. 20s, what would you say? Mm -hmm. And the second question, any recommendation you yeah. want to recommend to our audience? Yeah. So looking back, you know, here we're talking about life as immigrants. I find that I've spent so much time trying to learn the, the, the norms of my new country, trying to fit in, trying to understand how to become mm -hmm. part of the team so that I can contribute. So looking back, I probably would encourage myself to stand out more rather than fit mm -hmm. in more. Uh, because certainly you want to assimilate to the team. Uh, certainly you want to be relatable. Yet yeah. at the same time, we each bring unique perspectives and experiences and skills. We got to bring that uniqueness to the team, bring the full force of your passion and your expertise. And that's how you make the greatest contribution. Yes. So. Yeah, so that would be my greatest learning. And then in terms of a book or a movie, um, so many, uh, but my go-to is uh, a book called Mindset. It's by, my, by Carol Dweck, uh, a Stanford okay. psychologist who has done this really seminal work around your belief that you can grow, especially through challenges, kind of determines your ability to actually learn and grow and become that much more effective. There's so much research behind that. And quite frankly, it's very meaningful whether you're a parent mm -hmm. or a professional or a teacher or a leader. It is very uh, important lessons to be taken. Wonderful advice. I will check it out. Thank you for the recommendation. And thank you so much for your time, Ross. It's a privilege and pleasure to talk with you about your life, your adventure, and learning leadership, and most importantly, how to be a leader. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank and, you. Uh, Pleasure to be with you. Glad to have you here. Aloha. See you next time. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn.
and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.